In the early morning hours of September 26, 1979, a witness on the beach at Richardson Bay Park in Tiburon, California, noticed a bonfire. Early the next morning, a jogger in Blackie's pasture found charred human remains. Further investigation revealed the body belonged to a girl or young woman in her late teens or early 20s. She had been stabbed more than 40 times with an ice pick, set on fire, and a shot in the head, likely as she crawled away. She had been stabbed so hard that the ice pick broke off inside her body, and half of her face was burned beyond recognition. The gunshot wound was determined to be her official cause of death. An ice pick, a bullet, and acetone, the latter of which was thought to be the accelerant for the fire, were also found at the scene. The girl had been spotted at a Woolworth store in San Francisco, just 15 miles away, the day before her body was found. She was accompanied by an unknown man who bought the items that would later be used in her murder. He was described as a white male wearing a leisure type suit. But there were a few leads in the case of Tiburon Jane Doe. She was buried in December of 1979, and her case quickly went cold. It was reopened in 2001, and her body was exhumed in 2002 for DNA extraction. Investigators were only able to develop a partial profile, and no matches were found. In 2005, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children made a sketch of what Jane Doe may have looked like. This sketch was based on evidence found at the scene, as well as the side of her face that wasn't burned. In December of 2006, advances in technology and another examination of the evidence allowed for a full DNA profile to finally be developed from hairs found during Jane Doe's autopsy. Most of the other evidence had degraded over time. In February 2007, her DNA was uploaded into the FBI's National Missing Persons Database. That's when a tentative match was finally made. In September of 2007, it was officially announced that Tiburon Jane Doe had been identified as 17-year-old Tammy Vincent. Tammy, who lived in Washington State, ran away from home in the fall of 1978. She was last known to be working at a Seattle strip club called Tease and Rip. In August of 1979, the club was raided by police, who suspected the owners were secretly operating prostitution rings. Tammy agreed to testify against the owners and was put in a group home for her protection. However, a lawyer for one of the club owners was able to track her down and convince the group home owners to let her go with him. Tammy was reported missing later that month. In 2003, DNA was collected from Tammy's mother and sister. It was speculated that Tammy, who was still missing at the time, might have been a victim of Gary Ridgway. Also known as the Green River Killer, Ridgway killed at least 49 women in Washington State in the 1980s and 1990s. Investigators wanted to test Tammy's family DNA against that of four of Ridgway's unidentified victims. No matches were found, but it was this DNA that would allow Tammy to be identified a few years later. The investigation into Tammy's murder began soon after she was identified, but there have been very few updates in the case since. Police believe her killer is the man she was last seen with at Woolworths the night before she died, and that he had at least two accomplices. As of March 2022, this man is unidentified, and Tammy's murder remains unsolved. Sharon Kim Pryor was born on February 9th, 1959, to Mom Yvonne and Dad George. She would later welcome several younger siblings, including a foster brother. Sharon grew up in Point St. Charles, a neighborhood in Montreal, Quebec, in Canada. Loved ones said she had a radiant smile and that people enjoyed being around her. Sharon was very athletic and, like many Canadians, enjoyed playing hockey. She was also very cautious and didn't get into trouble a lot. She aspired one day to be a veterinarian. Saturday, March 29, 1975 
was the day before Easter. Around 7.15 that evening, 16-year-old Sharon left her house to meet some friends at a local pizza parlor. The walk should have only taken her about five minutes, but she never showed up. It's not clear if her friends actually expected her there. When she wasn't home by 1 a.m., Yvonne Pryor got worried. Her daughter was usually home by this time and always called if she was going to be late. The search for Sharon began right away, with police and volunteers alike turning up to look. Three days later, on April 1st, Sharon's body was found in a field in Long Gay, about 12 kilometers or seven and a half miles from Point St. Charles. She'd been beaten, raped, and strangled, the latter of which is thought to have caused her death. Her body had been dragged under a tree, and she still had a tree branch in her hand. Her jeans and underwear were found near her body, the latter hanging from a branch. There was tape in her hair that had presumably been put over her mouth as a gag. Police also found a shirt, tire marks, and a footprint nearby. The padlock to the gate was open, but there were no signs of force. The shirt was worn by someone about six feet tall and 200 pounds, and police believed it was also used to tie Sharon up. The footprint was made by someone who wore about a size eight and a half shoe. Sharon had been dead for about a day when her body was found. Police believed she'd been held captive, then dragged to the scene and left there while she was still alive. But other than this evidence, there wasn't much to go on. Police interviewed 38 people, six of whom they considered suspects, but all were ultimately let go. The investigation stalled and was later reopened in the early 2000s. In 2004, police got a tip that led them to a garage behind an apartment building not too far from Sharon's old house. About two dozen officers searched the garage for 15 hours, looking for evidence that Sharon had been there at some point. DNA samples were sent off for results, but ultimately found no matches. 70 potential suspects have been looked into, according to the National Post, but as of March 2022, no arrests have been made. So what happened to Sharon Pryor? Police believe there are at least two people involved in her murder. I never found a specific reason why they believe this, but author Alice DeSterler at Defrosting Cold Cases gives some insight. Remember, the shirt found at the scene was thought to be worn by someone who was about 6 feet tall and 200 pounds, and the footprint was made by someone who wore about a size 8.5 shoe. According to DeSterler, a man of the size and height to wear that shirt would be more likely to wear a larger shoe than eight and a half. Sharon's mom, Yvonne Pryor, wonders if her daughter may have been the victim of a serial killer. Multiple cases have been noted, both by her and online sleuths, of other female murder victims in Canada who are similar in age and looks to Sharon. There's also speculation that she was killed by a trucker which is a very common theory in unsolved cases, and one I've discussed in multiple videos. There's also speculation that Sharon's killer or killers knew the area well. The owner of the field Sharon was found in only discovered her remains when he realized the gate leading into the field was open. If it hadn't been for this, she likely wouldn't have been found until later on in the spring. Did Sharon's killer leave her in a place where they thought she wouldn't be found for months, perhaps hoping that much of the evidence would have decayed or been destroyed by then? Whatever happened, Sharon's murder has gone unsolved for almost 47 years. Her loved ones hope that advances in DNA technology or someone coming forward with previously withheld information will one day solve this case.